Why do you think 100 years is considered an audacious goal for launching an interstellar ship? That's a, that's a tremendous question, and I think it really is an audacious challenge. Um, I think the problem comes into context when we, you consider what we've accomplished to date. So if you think that the Voyager probe, which is mankind's fastest object, or one of the fastest objects we've ever launched, is traveling at about 10 miles per second. Now, um, traveling at that speed, it would take about 70,000 years to reach the closest mm -hmm. star. So step one, there are vast propulsion challenges we need to overcome. We need to really uh, increase our top speeds. I mean, if we want to accomplish um, an interstellar flight, uh, an interstellar mission on time scales of a human lifetime, we need to reach an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. So, you know, at least sort of five, 10 percent the speed of light. Um, but there are a number of mechanisms or another of, uh, a number of ways we can liberate energy from matter uh, to accomplish that goal. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, we, we need to make breakthroughs in, for example, understanding uh, thermonuclear fusion, uh, potentially uh, making progress in, in antimatter propulsion systems, beamed energy propulsion systems, and also uh, keep in mind that the solutions might lay outside of the box, things that we haven't thought about yet. And of course, propulsion is just one of the challenges. I mean, when you're traveling incredibly fast, um, you, need, you need powerful shielding, because even a small dust particle is going to uh, uh, reduce the integrity of your starship. I mean, it's like a small atomic bomb going off on, on, mm -hmm. the, on the skin of the vessel. Then there's communications issues, uh, 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 redundancy issues, you know, how you keep a starship functioning for 50, 100 years, however long it takes. So um, the idea that we could do it in 100 years is, is certainly audacious, um, because we're, we're, we're a long way off from that at this stage. Do you think it's possible that it could be in the next 50 years? I mean, is, there, is it possible that we can make some major advances in the next couple of years to do that? You know, I think it's certainly possible, uh, but I don't know if it's plausible. And it's really uh, dependent on the, on the rate of technological progress. Mm -hmm. um, if you take, uh, so for example, some examples from history, I don't think anyone would have predicted in 1907 that just 50 years later, you know, we would have launched uh, Sputnik 1, the, the Earth's first uh, artificial sat satellite. Exactly. Or in 1919, that just 50 years later, Neil Armstrong would be walking on the moon. I mean, at that point, um, space travel was, uh, and manned space travel was just quite simply science fiction. So uh, if you extrapolate our current technology linearly, I think the idea that we would be engaging in interstellar missions in 50 years is, is highly unlikely. However, um, if there are dis disruptive technologies, disruptive breakthroughs, things that we didn't expect to, to manifest themselves, breakthroughs, then, then it's a possibility. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's important never to say never. You know, it, it would be incorrect to say we'll never launch in 50 years. What we know now, it's very unlikely. I would agree with that. It's good to never say never, definitely. Um, but where do we stand right now? Um, right now, uh, I think a lot of the work on a starship is in a, its early embryonic stages. Uh, we got a long way. I like that go. word, embryonic. Thank <laughs> you. It's one of my favorites. Uh, I'm going to use it in my talk tomorrow. So you know, we're, we're at a very, very early stage. We've, got a, we've still got a lot of, a lot of ways to go. And I think. Um, Although some of the big challenges are obviously technological, uh -huh. I think one of the biggest ch challenges is arguably social. So um, an interstellar mission is going to cost probably hundreds of billions, perhaps trillions of dollars. And people don't even like the fact that NASA has a, has a budget on the order of about $20 billion today. You know, I mean, That's true. It's, I mean, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's one of the best ways we could spend our resources. But mm -hmm. you know, uh, people think that the money is being wasted. So real, I think one of the real challenges is to sort of convince people that this is a worthwhile and a worthy goal. How do you think people can get more involved from the social aspect? Uh, you know, I think there's a In lot really pushing this forward. You know, I think there's a lot of ways they can get involved. And, you know, this is going to be a pan-generational project, a multi-decadal project. So yeah. you, it's really getting everyone behind it. So, you know, that starts with, with, with young kids at school getting their grandma and granddad excited about it. And that starts with parents getting their kids excited about it. It's about really understanding why we want to engage in interstellar mission. I mean, you know, there, there are a few possibilities out there. We could go out there and we could find the universe is teeming with life. We could go out there and find that the universe is empty. Either one, to me, is equally exciting. Mm -hmm. You know, if the universe is teeming with life, then, then that's incredible in terms of, you know, what we could learn about ourselves and our own place in the universe. If the universe is devoid of life, and, you know, then it's almost our gift to sort of spread who we are to the universe. It's like, you know, an, an open book almost. Hey, welcome. We're so cool. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, how can someone get involved? How can someone get involved with Icarus Interstellar? 
This is a really good question. So I think one of the nice things about our program is that, you know, we get a lot of volunteers and traditionally in the early days it was uh, people from a, a math and engineering and science background. Mm -hmm. But we've really broadened that and we're looking for a, a real, a real uh, panorama of expertise. So, you know, recently we had a chap um, contact us and his expertise was in um, architectural design. And so... Uh, okay, that's kind of far out exactly. from us interstellar space travel. Exactly, precisely. So you wouldn't think that that is some, you know, someone who would be able to contribute, yeah. but, but this gentleman has contributed uh, a, a great research paper. So he's looking at the idea of world ships, multi-generational ships, and coming at it from the perspective of, of okay, what does the interior have to look like? You know, mm -hmm. how do you keep the people on board satisfied? You can't lock people up for generations in a tin can. So, you know, it's really about looking at people's skills and trying to be creative about how they can contribute um, to the mission. Mm -hmm. What if someone doesn't have time to, you know, come in and dedicate a lot of time? What if they just want to contribute money? Is there a way to do that? Yeah, certainly. Uh, we have a donations page on our website. It's on uh, the top nav navigation link. You can visit IcarusInterstellar.org, uh, and then in the top right, there's a little uh, donation link. So, uh, you know, we're more than happy for, for people to, to support us and, and help us with our with our mission. Another way, we've recently launched uh, one of our directors, Robert Freeland, has uh, launched an affinity uh, card program. Uh, so you can sign like up. Like a credit card program? Exactly. Oh, what does that do? Well, you get your own uh, personal credit card with a Starship on the side. Okay, that's cool enough exactly. of a reason yeah, to join. And, and Capital One Bank donates uh, a little bit of money every time you, 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 you spend things on that card. Okay, so every time you swipe it just to get like McDonald's or gas or whatever, money goes towards Icarus Interstellar? Yeah, between 1% and 2%. All right, that's, yeah. that's a good return. So that's a good way for, for people who don't have the time to help support what we're doing. Okay. Tell me about the VARIES probe. Okay, VARIES stands for Vacuum to Antimatter Rocket Interstellar Explorer System. And what I'm really interested in is looking at some novel and unique architectures for interstellar missions. So traditionally, um, interste uh, interstellar uh, designs for interstellar starships have been a flyby mission. So one salient mm -hmm. example is the Daedalus project. The reason, when I say a flyby, what I mean is um, the Starship accelerates to its top speed, uh, about 12% of the speed of light for Daedalus, and just zips through the target solar system in a matter of a few hours, yeah. zips by a planet uh, in a period of a few seconds. The reason why uh, flybys are the Really, arguably one of the simplest to study um, is because you're going to minimize the mass. You know, the objective is how do you get to another star? Exactly. What Project Icarus, interestingly, is looking at is a, a, a perturbation of that model. It's how, how do you accelerate and then decelerate in the target system? So that's what we mm -hmm. would call, instead of a flyby, a rendezvous mission. So the Varies is an interstellar... A rendezvous mission. Exactly, All precisely. Right. It's very romantic. It's a rendezvous with, a, with, a, with another star. <laughs> So the Varies is um, an interstellar rendezvous and return mission. So the mm -hmm. idea is, okay, uh, is it possible in the future that we're going to want to look at more architectures than simply a flyby or once you get there, you're stuck? Might we want to uh, come back to Earth? And, and a salient example is uh, if you have astronauts or, or, or crews there, there might come an example when people want to come back to Earth or a mission where you can go from star to star. And so the idea behind the Varies, one of the challenges with these types of missions is that you need to pack a whole load of fuel. And so the idea behind the Varies is that you can do in situ creation of your fuel. And that comes from um, a, a, a really a novel idea uh, based on um, quantum field theory, which indicates that uh, the vacuum consists uh -huh. of uh, it's a seething inferno of virtual particles that come into and out of existence in a short period of time. And the I main idea here is um, something called, utilizing something called the Schwinger pair mechanism, mm -hmm. which is when you have a strong enough electric field from a, a sufficiently intense laser, you can actually turn those virtual particles into real particle, antiparticle pairs, and use them uh, to fuel your spacecraft for the next stage of the mission. So you're basically creating your own fuel along the way? Yeah, the idea is you wouldn't really create it along the way. Once you reach the target solar system, you'd pull into some parking orbit around the star, okay. and you would unfurl vast solar panels, and then those solar panels would convert sunlight directly into laser energy, which would um, uh, bubble particles up from the vacuum, which would then be stored and then used for fuel. 